I want to tell you about two leaders who radically changed my life. One for the worst, the other for the better. It was 1960 in Dallas. I had just returned. I'm a Texan. But I'd gone to seminary at Drew, and during that time I taught in the public schools there and in prisons and done some uh, inner city work in Harlem. And I was very excited about the great privilege of getting to teach. And when I came back to Dallas, I joined an elementary school as the art teacher, and there were about a 1,000 children. And I was bright-eyed and full of hope. And at the end of that year, I received a failing report. And my principal said to me, you're not even mediocre. You're really pretty poor, but if you come back, maybe I can help you. Now, I'll tell you something about that year. He had uh, PTA meetings purposefully in the day so the teachers couldn't attend. And many of the parents couldn't either. And it lessened the number, and he thought, therefore, it lessened the problem. So you're beginning to get a picture of this person. He didn't trust the teachers to talk to parents, and he thought the less we came together, the better. He didn't trust children. This is elementary, and this is 1960, but we were to report early, and my job was to patrol the bushes. <laughs> elementary children, but he was fearful that they might get in the bushes and do things. <laughs> uh, at lunch, children were not given the privilege of choosing where to sit or who to sit with. They had assigned seats and were not allowed to talk because there was fear about what might be said or done. Children were not allowed to go uh, singly to the restrooms alone. They had to be lined up and someone always with them. The level of trust was so low, you can imagine what the behavior was. Can you guess that? The more you control, the least controllable they were because they were not invited to trust. And um, one of the reasons I had such a terrible report, I was the art teacher and I thought kids need to do fun things and I thought learning ought to be fun. And, we did, we worked with a lot of inexpensive media and we'd do these rice mosaics and you know, rice would get in the sink and you turn on the water and it puffs, puffs up and <laughs> you got plumbing bills and that's bad. And uh, he would come past my room and there'd be joy. They would be abundantly joyful. They'd be out of their seats doing things together and he'd say, you know, you need to control those children. They need to be seated and quiet. And uh, we just had a difference of opinion. And yet, at the end of the year, I sat and wept and thought, if he's right, I need to leave. So I wrote my letter of resignation. And fortunately for me, my supervisor took me aside and said, Ann, you have great imagination and great love, and we need you in the schools, but we need to put you with a different teacher. And I would tell you, during that year, my, the spark of enthusiasm grew dimmer. Uh, and I'm, I'm being kind to myself in that. My attitudes and behaviors were less and less passionate as I got more and more fearful and began to spread the paranoia myself. Um, the next September, I, did, I was thinking, gee, you know, I need to go into business, and if I damage a product, you can replace it, but if you damage a child, that's a life. You know, you can't mess up on little kids. It's too vital. It's too important. But Evelyn Beard, my supervisor, said, let me, I've done a bad job matching you. Let me put you with a different kind of person. And the next year, I had the great good fortune of going to Everett Lee de Gaulier School. And my principal was a man named Wade Thompson. Big man, been a coach, now a principal of, in fact, he was being punished by the school system, so he was sent to an elementary school, lucky for us. He was a wonderful man, a great servant leader, soft-spoken, but with huge wisdom and a huge heart. Now, this was the low point of my life. I had a little toddler son whom I loved dearly, but I was in a very painful marriage. My husband was brilliant, but had severe mental disorders and was frequently violent and abusive. So it was not unusual for me to be awakened with a really frightening, violent outburst in the middle of the night. So by the time I was getting my son up and trying to get breakfast, I was dodging and trying to deal with whatever had happened to me, black eye, whatever. It's really hard to be organized when you're 
in a war zone. And at that time, um, there was no one to talk to. And so I didn't even tell my parents. Uh, I felt there was something wrong with me. It was just survive. And so one morning, I was trying to get my son to the, the child care center and get to school. And um, no surprise to you, I wasn't on time. In fact, I was about 20 minutes late. And in teaching, that's very serious. You can't be late. Children are in the classroom. There's no teacher. And as I drove in the parking lot, my heart was beating. The fear was back there. But now I, I'd let down my school. And so I was really scared and thinking, oh, you're going to lose your job. And there was my principal, and he didn't walk to the car. He ran. And I thought, he can't wait to fire me. <laughs> and my mouth was dry, and I didn't know what to say. And he said, how can I help you? And I couldn't hear that. I thought he's going to make me feel bad, and then he's going to fire me. Well, I had boxes in the trunk of oatmeal boxes and newspapers and magazine and fabric scraps. And when you're an art teacher, you're gathering up all this stuff. That's what kids work with. And so I said, well, you have a lot of stuff to carry. And he said, great. He picked it up and carried it in. And I was just, I was just devastated. And we got to the classroom. He said, you know, Ann, I haven't gotten to start a class for a while. May I start your class? And the kids were so glad to see him. And why don't you go around and have a cup of coffee? And I thought, He's really shaming me. You know, in my heart, I was so in the victim mode, I couldn't receive this graciousness coming. It just made me feel worse. And so you know, I don't think I got coffee. I just took my coat off, and I kind of slunk back to the room. I'm here. I'm ready. And I was just feeling so bad and all into myself. And the morning, he didn't fire me. And lunch, he didn't fire me. And the afternoon was my planning period. And I thought, we've got to get it over. So I went in, and I said, I, I know this is awful. I know it's not the first time. I feel so terrible. Please, you know, let's just get it over. And he looked at me, and he said, oh, Ann, come sit down. And he came to a chair, and he invited me. He came out from behind his desk, and he took my hand in his. He had big bear paw hands, huge hands. He was a farmer. And he said, Ann, and he looked in my eyes, and he was crying. He said, I need you. You care. You know, he said, I know you're a mom. He said, I got grandchildren. My kids are grown. And, and he said, sometimes we need each other for help. The kids need you, but you need us. And he said, let me tell you what. I've noticed sometimes it's hard for you to be here uh, on time, but <clears throat> I'm a farmer. I'm always up here. I'm always here early. So I'll watch the parking lot. And any time I don't see your car, no, I'm in your classroom. I'll start it. Don't worry. Just do what you need to do. Because once you're here, oh, the school is better. Good things are happening. Art comes out of their heart. What you do with the kids, I've never seen anyone else do. So let me be your partner. I couldn't imagine it. Let me be your partner. Well, you can imagine after that, I learned all kinds of ways to be there early when I could. But being late left my vocabulary as much as I could. Later, when there was violence and my husband had a gun, again, I went to him and said, I can't come to school. What if he comes and the children get shot? And he said, you come to school where you're safe. Mr. Biles, our custodian, and I will watch out. You need to be with your family. Can you imagine? Now, that just wasn't me. There were a 1,000 kids in that school. And as we went through the years, I taught with him nine years, there were no locks. Not on the lockers, not on the bicycles. And from time to time, something would disappear. And there'd come a voice on the loudspeakers, and he'd say, Pamela has lost 37 cents, and it's her lunch money. And without it, she'll go hungry. Now, we'll loan her money. But the important thing for us to do, we're a community. I want everyone to start looking for the 37 cents. And when you find it, bring it to the office so we can return it to her. And if you found it and had joy and thought your lucky day, think again. We need to think about where it came from and why the person needs it and how she'll feel going home. He taught us the importance about caring for each other. And it was a big deal. And we always found the 37 cents. And the book and the bicycle, he taught people when you are a community, you don't need locks, because trust is more power than locks. There was a summer five years in. Amazing things happened. You can see how it transformed me. Two young boys had moved in from Chicago. And it was summer, and they were bored, and they went over to the school. And with rocks, 
they had a little target practice going to see who could break the windows up high in the gym. And a car came by, and there were three high school kids, and they stopped and walked over and said, hey, you must be new in the neighborhood. And the little guys didn't know whether they, they were going to get them or what. And they were kind of hunkered down. They said, yeah, what's it to you? And they said, well, well, we want to tell you. Do you live close by? Where do you live? And they were kind of fearful, and they began to tell me. They said, oh, boy, you are so lucky. This is a really special school. This is going to be your school. And tell us what you're doing. Well, they knew what they were doing. They said, you know, instead of breaking windows, they looked around. They said, we got some aluminum cans, pop cans. So let's put them over there, and we'll join you. And so they began to have fun with the cans. And then they said, you know, it's getting light. Um, we need to do something about those windows. And they said, where, are you, where do you live? Let us take you home so your parents will know you're going with us. And they went and talked to the parents. They took them to the hardware store. They got the glass. They made a date with the custodian to get the ladder and help the young boys climb up and reinstall the windows. And then they said, now we'll need to pay for the glass, and we'll tell you what we did. And I was going to ask you, and I gave it away, how do you think the high school boys knew what to do? You got a clue? They'd done it when they were 11 or 12. And Wade Thompson and Mr. Biles had taught them to take responsibility and how to have fun and how to protect property. It was that kind of school. I was the art teacher many times. Wade Thompson would come to me and say, can you tell me anything good about John and Tom? And they'd been brought by the ear to the office for doing something. And he wanted to know the good parts of their life. So he'd come to the art room and the gym teacher and the music room and the library to see what they did well because he wanted to start from their high points and then teach them how to bring value to the school instead of diminishing the community. Well, I told you about my early performance review. At the end of nine years, I was chosen as one of the first teacher of the year for DISD. And it was clear it wasn't me. It was Wade Thompson and the community he built around each of us. One of my students from that school, Kip Tyndall, is one of the principals of the container store. And it was my great joy to go and celebrate with Kip and his team as they were chosen number one best company in America to work for. And so the joy of servant leadership is transforming lives. It's like a pebble that drops in the water. And it is an evolution of maturity. Early on, remember when it felt so good to do it myself, I'd rather do it myself and be sure it's done right. And that's the joy of learning that I can make a difference. But servant leadership is that giant step. It's much harder. It takes a different kind of heart. Learning to step back and help others make the difference. Learning how to sublimate your need to get it done, to use it as an opportunity to help others discover their incredible capacity. That's what it's about. 